let me introduce Dr. Latimer. So uh, she's one of our own. I'm very proud to say and excited to say I've had a chance to work with her um, in, in a few different ways throughout the years. Um, and so she's going to talk to us particularly about um, the WBU Advance Project. She has many. We did send her bio with the invite, so I encourage everyone to take a look at that because it's it is far more than the Advanced Center, but um, so the Advanced Center is designed to improve um, our understanding of barriers to large-scale organizational change. Um, here at the center, we've talked a lot about our efforts. This Advanced Center is doing that at the university level and beyond, so I'm hoping that there would be connections along the way. Um, Dr. Latimer's research particularly looks at inequality in the labor market and in terms of welfare um, and, and how um, individuals experience different aspects of the social insurance system and social assistance programs. So as a function of our center, we serve populations that this might be, her research might be very pertinent uh, to us to know a little bit about. Um, the bio spoke to a lot of grant funding that Dr. Latimer has brought into the institution as well as her colleagues both in the sociology department and the advanced center. So again, please refer back to that for specifics, um, but for sake of time, Dr. Latimer, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. So just as a couple of questions for me, is the volume okay in terms of coming at you? And the second thing is, if people are typing questions, will I be able to see it or will you be able to see it? And are you in charge of handling that, Leslie? So I think there's some, there's some background noise, and I'm not sure if it's your ear, uh, if, you, if it's your sound or not. Maybe it's on your computer or your phone. I'm not sure. Um, but in terms of the chat, I, I don't think you'll see it because you'll have your slides up, and I'm happy to kind of interject or wait to the end okay. to say this, whatever you prefer. So I don't have a phone on. I'm just using my computer. So I'm not sure what's causing the background noise, and it's one of the reasons that I'm using the headset. Should I take should I take the plugs off and see if it makes it better? Um, if that's helpful to you, go ahead and just just keep them on, and I'll try to okay. manage it from my my perspective. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so let me go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk to you about the Advanced Center. Uh, so um, again, acknowledging. Uh, the life that I had before I became the director of the Advanced Center. I am trained as a sociologist. I came to the university in 1994. I'm a professor of sociology. I was also the chair of my department for five years. And so I do study labor market inequality. And the first 15 years of my career studied uh, welfare reform and the impact on economically disadvantaged uh, families, uh, specifically in Appalachia and in West Virginia. So I can talk about that research if you want, but that's the, that, that background essentially set me up for the work that I'm uh, currently doing as a director of the Advanced Center. Okay, And as you can see on the front, we're just acknowledging the National Science Foundation uh, in terms of the funding um, for this grant. So the first thing I want to do is tell you a little bit about um, the team that I've put together. So we submitted a grant funding in 2009, and so we have been meeting weekly since 2009. This team has been meeting weekly since 2009. So this is a long-standing working group. Now, some of these people that I have listed here are uh, new to Advance. Some of them had been there from the very beginning. Um, and so one of the things I just want to point out is that there is uh, an, an, an a variety of diversity in terms of the rank that people are at, uh, that we have at least three colleges represented, and we have someone from DEI who is also part of our team. Uh, people are in different types of positions, um, and most of the original, um, all of the original people who are on the grant have been promoted at least once since the grant, and some of them um, have been, will have been promoted twice within like a year or so. So the team uh, themselves have been uh, very active and very successful. Okay. Uh, Leslie, you just disappeared, but I'm assuming everything is okay. I'm still here. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So 
let me just move on. Uh, I wanted to tell you the type of grant that we had. We actually finished our funding from the National Science Foundation at the end of September of this year. So it is, uh, the grant is called an Advanced Institutional Transformation Grant. They're called IT grants. These are the largest advanced grants that you can get. They have uh, smaller ones that are like $750,000. These are grants for a whole institution with the intention of essentially uh, removing the barriers to recruitment, retention, promotion, and leadership for women and under, other underrepresented faculty in STEM. So again, this particular funding from the National Science Foundation is focusing on faculty and diversifying the faculty. There are other um, NSF initiatives that focus on uh, drawing people into STEM as early as uh, elementary school. There are advanced grant, um, sorry, there are NSF grants that focus on um, uh, diversifying people who are doing postdocs, uh, people in college, but this particular one focuses on faculty. And so, as such, the Advanced Center, as originally formulated and still today, focuses on uh, faculty. So it's not that we don't care about students, it's just that what we're focusing on is what are the barriers to uh, drawing more women and faculty of color to WVU, and then once they get here, keeping them here and uh, you know, at, ensuring that they are moving through the promotion and tenure process. Okay? So those are the original goals of the advanced grant. And when we put this funding, uh, this grant together, in 2009, we basically had to do a comprehensive analysis of our whole institution and say, like, what are the problems we have here? Where are the problems, right? And then we had to pitch to NSF, what is it we're going to do that we think, what is this five-year plan for removing those barriers so that we, by the time the grant ends, and the funding should have ended in 2015, but I was able to um, do matching funds and stuff, extend the grant all the way to 2018, but the institution must be in a better place at the end of it. And at the end of the grant, the institution is responsible for taking those efforts to the next level. So the first uh, level of funding uh, to launch it and to legitimate the work comes from the National Science Foundation. And you could, these were our original three uh, project aims, um, and I can tell you more about those, but I, I think um, what's more important is see like what did we actually do because um, a lot of this language probably doesn't make sense in context so let me just focus on um, what are some of our significant project outcomes so one of the things because I am a social scientist and I um, use data to understand Essentially, I, I use data to understand what's happening in West Virginia with welfare reform. I do that for every, everything that I study. And so one of the things that we found in 2009 when we were putting this proposal together is that we just didn't have um, regular systematic data collection. Um, so we didn't really understand what was going on at the institution. We knew there were problems. We knew that we were losing uh, some groups of people, mostly faculty of color, faster than other uh, faculty, and, but we didn't really understand why. And so what I basically said is, you know, do we have an exit survey? And people were like, no, we don't have exit surveys for faculty or for staff. And so I initiated in 2009 exit surveys for faculty and staff. I convinced the institution that they needed to participate in the coach survey. Uh, which is a faculty satisfaction survey that is run out of Harvard. We participate that in that now every three to five years. Um, there are also there were no regular culture surveys happening, and nor was there uh, any attempt to essentially look at salary assessments and make adjustments. And so, um, one of the things that we were able to achieve with Advance is create to change the culture around data collection not just collecting it and sharing it with the higher ups, but sharing it with the campus. I think some of the earliest times that I met Leslie was with faculty welfare um, committee or with faculty senate sharing some of the data 
that we uh, had gotten uh, based on a coach survey and sharing with them like what does this mean in terms of what's happening on our campus and then what do we need to do um, based on these data. So I started this practice of more systematic data collection, sharing it with the campus, and then essentially using the data to inform our decision making. So if we didn't have a lot of money, and that's pretty much WVU every single year, we have an extra X amount of money, how should we use that money to improve uh, recruitment, retention, promotion of faculty if I'm given some of that funding? I like to do that based on uh, a variety of data sources. And so we now have that culture. You're asked uh, on a regular basis if you're faculty to participate in the coach survey. We have these culture surveys that um, HR now called talent and culture have been doing regularly. And we've uh, received raises this fall based on long-term pressure by Advance and other, other uh, people participating in that process and saying, you know, we need to regularly look at our faculty's salary. It is the number one issue raised by faculty in every single survey. And that's one of the things that's affecting their satisfaction. Um, so look at our salaries, look at them relative to our Big 12 peers or other peers, and make reg regular um, uh, changes in salary to try to, adjustments to try to improve those, uh, to remove some of those disc discrepancies. And we've started that process. Okay, so let me uh, move on to another um, project outcome. Wow, I have to push the button like five times. One of the one of the things that I'm most proud of is uh, some changes in policy um, and the addition of resources that better support work-life integration. Um, you know, some people say, you know, I don't really like the word integration, um, uh, but we think that balance is almost impossible sometimes given the way that academia is set up. And so we talk about uh, the fact that these worlds are connected to each other and that we need to do a better job of helping faculty and staff uh, integrate and not have to pick between work life and family life. And so um, given that we were focusing on um, women in academia, this was one of the primary issues that was identified by our faculty in earlier survey, uh, early survey in 2009. And so what we've done, we spent a, have a lot of time and energy. Um, we created something called PWAP, but the best way to think of it is parental leave. Um, it is uh, parental leave for nine-month faculty who do not accrue leave. So in health sciences, um, a lot of people, most most faculty are 12 months, uh, and and or they are in clinical positions and they accrue leave and so what they have available to them is the ability to use sick leave and their accrued leave to support um, uh, them or their uh, partner when they have children. Uh, what we found with tenure track faculty is they were playing an odds game of just uh, for years trying to get pregnant so that the baby was, was born right at the edge of uh, the Christmas holidays or summertime and that was just uh, unacceptable. It's incredibly stressful for those families. And so what we have is, like I said, it's, it's parental leave for people who do not accrue leave, and it's done without a salary modification, which means that um, there's no decrease in salary. This is for um, birth, adoption, or guardian, guardianship of a child. Um, but we also expanded that to cover any type of caring for family. So if you're ill yourself, if your partner is sick or ill, uh, caring for a parent, because we know that uh, um, certain generations are also dealing with parents, and we know among them that it's disproportionately women who are doing that. And so we have care for the early part of the life cycle, which is dealing with uh, the addition of children, and we have it more of the middle part of the life cycle that could deal with uh, aging and care for a parent, as well as um, anything that could happen to someone in the family, including the family member. And what that does is we remove the formal teaching assignment for the semester in which the event occurs or immediately following it. And I can talk to you more about that later, but I just wanted to let you know that that's what it is. 
with these, the change from BOG policies to rules, we went ahead and moved from a procedure and made it an official um, BOG rule, and it's called um, it's now called modified duties. And those things are put together uh, any to accommodate any significant per personal circumstance. And this was one of our uh, most significant accomplishments. Um, we now have it where if any time a faculty member utilizes the modified duties policy and they are untenured, there is an automatic extension of the tenure clock for that utilization. Uh, before this year, uh, faculty members first had to apply for um, the parental leave and then they had to apply for an extension to the tenure clock. So they had two different sets of papers that had to be filled out and had to go up through the system. We now have an opt-out policy where they audit, we automatically extend the tenure clock unless it's their critical year. Um, and a faculty member could actually uh, choose not to opt out. I mean, they could choose um, to opt out of the extension, um, but it's automatically in unless they choose to opt out. And what we think that does is it normalizes it, and basically um, we give people the option of reestablishing their original tenure clock if they want to, or they can uh, have up to three extensions of that clock, uh, giving them the timing of it and the circumstances that they, are, that they experience. Um, we've also added uh, family travel funds of up to $800 per fiscal year to cover care caregiven expenses, and we've, uh, we've ensured that this is not just for faculty, but this is also for po postdoc scholars. Uh, we're trying to push it down in for graduate students as well, but we don't have the funding for it, but we're encouraging departments to essentially do something equivalent for graduate students or some modified version of it. Essentially, anybody that has, uh, that their ability to go to a conference to present their research to stay fully engaged in the discipline is affected by substantial dependent care responsibilities. We actually um, provide funding to cover the cost of bringing a partner to care for the child, bringing another family member, paying someone in the town where you're going, paying for child care at the conference. Some conferences ac actually provide that. So it's, it's about $800 to help uh, pay for their uh, expenses. Um, and we find that a, a large number of people are utilizing that. Um, we got an Elsevier grant to start with, um, and then the university um, began paying for it. And so now the university pays for that. And it's just part of when you fill out your faculty travel funds, you can click a button and also do it for family travel expenses. And the other thing that we did is that we, we found out that the dual career program, when it first started, was just covering non-academic job placement. And what we know about women in academia is that they're significantly more likely to uh, have an academic partner. And so we had a dual career program, but it was disproportionately um, essentially not helping women uh, who had academic partners. And so what I encourage them to do is to, you know, ex extend those benefits, cover academic job placement. And now we're part of um, uh, a regional system uh, of institutions so that that academic job placement might not be just at WVU, it could be at some of our surrounding schools that we have um, partnerships with. And I also found out that there was, it was creating a bit, bit of um, resentment because it, the, the focus on dual career was just for people that we were trying to recruit and we weren't focusing on it in terms of re, uh, retention. And so um, those people who were hired before the dual career program started didn't benefit from it. And so what I suggested is that they also expand it and they, uh, when they have the resources to do that, they also expand and cover partners of existed, existing employees. Uh, one of the other things that we focused on is essentially how do we recruit? Um, and we spent a lot of, a lot of uh, time uh, training people on implicit bias. What is it? How to be aware of it? And how to in intervene in the process? We've tried to carry that same information over into uh, the promotion and tenure process. The types of biases that affect how we evaluate uh, potential colleagues when we're trying to hire them uh, also affect 
the way we assess those colleagues on an annual basis as well as for promotion and tenure. We've designed an innovative training um, that uh, deals with implicit bias awareness and intervention. And we've spent a lot of time focusing on uh, changes in the promotion and tenure guidelines. And it was all about expanding those guidelines uh, so that they don't just focus on um, tenure track uh, faculty, but they also focus on all types of faculty appointment. And so there have been a lot of changes and in information about service professors, originally called clinicals, um, professors on this side of campus, um, on uh, re RAPs, research assistant professors, and uh, TAPs, teaching assistant associate and professors. So there's a lot more information in that promotion and tenure guideline. There's a lot more information about the rights that those faculty have and that they are equivalent to the rights of tenure track faculty and that they can hold any position on our campus. Uh, and that was really important, uh, particularly in the STEM units um, in the Eberly College and in Statler College, which is where most of STEM are located. Um, a lot of women in STEM are actually in teaching, teaching positions. They're teaching professors. And so they were being blocked out of voting uh, in some departments. And so a lot of our work was done to sort of expand um, the guidelines and to pull more people into the process so that they see themselves in that guideline and that everybody is given more clear uh, guidance about evaluating and the rights of those faculty members, regardless of whether or not they're tenure track. We've also um, expanded the path to professor for tenured associate professors. So uh, it used to be essentially that um, to be promoted from assistant to associate, you had to have significant contributions in research and teaching. Okay, that's still true for tenure track faculty. Um, but that it used to be that to get to professor, you had to have the exact same thing, significant contributions in teaching and research to get to the rank of professor. And what that, what that does is it locks people in to a certain distribution of effort and it doesn't necessarily track their strengths uh, or their areas of genius and um, the place where they really uh, do well, uh, or changes in careers and changes in interest that sometimes happen. And so what we've done is we've opened up the opportunities for people, um, associate professors who were, are tenured, that if they do extended administrative search, such as um, service, such as being a department chair, I would argue even being um, a faculty uh, chair of the faculty senate, um, that for extraordinary and extended administrative service, uh, it's possible that for them to be promoted to the rank of professor. And then we made it possible for people with outstanding contributions in any one mission area, such as teaching, to be promoted um, to professor. So those are some of the significant uh, outcomes in terms of recruitment and uh, evaluation that, uh, that's attributed to advance. Um, we also know that some of the issues that were raised by our faculty is that, that there's just not enough mentoring. It came up in every single survey, mentoring and sponsorship of faculty. Uh, everybody, assistant professors, associate professors, even full professors, right? Uh, and so uh, one of the things we were able to do with advance is create, um, we, we created, um, uh, we convinced the institution to buy an institutional membership with the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. And we that that um, membership has been ongoing since like, I don't know, 2012, 2013. Um, and that is not just for faculty, it's also for postdoc and graduate students. And what they focus on is increasing writing productivity. They really focus on the fact that most people don't finish their PhDs at the dissertation stage, right? So they focus with graduate students a lot on writing productivity and how to write. Uh, and they do the same thing for faculty members. They have different boot, writing boot camps for graduate students and for faculty members. And um, we've said, oh gosh, I think it's about 130 of our faculty have gone to their writing boot camp. And the data overwhelmingly, 90% of the faculty say that it was outstanding. 
it increased your writing productivity, and they would completely recommend it for another faculty member. They basically said, why don't we just build in the cost of a boot camp into people's offer letters as part of their startup packages? That's how effective. And that's how I'm able to continue to, to uh, get the institution to pay for that. Uh, once you pay for the institutional membership, everybody that's an alumni of that boot camp program gets to continue in that boot camp program for free. So it's actually cheaper for us to do that institutional membership than to keep buying those boot camps for those individuals. Uh, so that's an external sponsorship program, program that focuses on writing productivity, but they are uh, writing and research productivity, but they also focus on um, uh, work-life integration and balance. And it, it was designed by a sociologist who's a uh, faculty of color, and so it comes from um, it's designed by somebody who's more on the margins of the of academia, who's incredibly successful, who's trying to help people on the outskirts of academia sometimes who don't have those mentors to teach them the uh, the formal and the informal rules so that they can uh, do better navigating the system and be more successful. And that we really like that um, um, uh, external um, uh, mentoring program. And until we find something better, we will continue to renew our membership. Uh, Advance also created an external sponsorship program for faculty members. And um, essentially, in a nutshell, this is what, what it is. Um, it's now institutionalized where it's built into the startup packages uh, for uh, all faculty in Sattler as well as in the Everly College of Arts and Sciences. The way we did it with Advance, they don't do it exactly like us, but we gave, uh, they had to apply for the funding. $10,000 to the faculty member, $5,000 to an external sponsor. The faculty member had to reach out to a prominent person in the field who had achieved the thing that they were trying to achieve. So if they needed to get an NSF career award in chemistry, they needed to be working with somebody who got a career award in chemistry. And uh, in particular, it would be especially helpful if it was in the field that they were studying, right? Uh, if they needed to get two or three articles in top journals, as part of their promotion and tenure process, then they work with someone who had been successful doing that. And they had to ask that person to be their sponsor for a year. And uh, I've got some data from the people who participated in our sponsorship program that I want to share with you. So the, the first thing, uh, so let me just tell you, there are a lot of ways that you can get this data. We asked them to do quarterly reports, and then we asked them to do, um, we, that would end up being too many reports uh, NSF was making us write too many reports, and we did the same thing to them, and so we modified it. And so it was um, at midpoint of the year, they would give us a report, and then they would give us a final report. Okay? So one way of getting this data is to actually look at those final reports. We decided we wanted to take a longer view approach, and so um, about two months ago, I reached out to everyone who had received a sponsorship uh, grant from us at Advance, and we said, we need you to look at your VITA and tell us every funding, award, everything, article, book, that you attribute to the sponsorship work that you did over the time that we funded you. And just cut and paste it and drop it and give it to us, right? So instead of us taking credit for something that we, we might, we, we just didn't know, right? And we asked them, tell us how this sponsorship affected your publications, your grant funding. So I took all that and uh, put it together. And we, what I didn't put on here is that there were four books. Um, people on average published two peer-reviewed publications um, just with that, um, uh, that one year of uh, support. Uh, they used it to um, train their students. Uh, like, for example, we had like, um, uh, to uh, um, I think it was a couple of dissertations there, master students that were trained. Um, on average, they uh, brought in another three hundred eighty thousand dollars. So remember, we only gave them fifteen, and on average, uh, per person, it was about three hundred eighty thousand dollars. Now, some people got two million dollars, and some people got fifty thousand dollars, but. What mattered was, did they get the money or the grant they needed as outlined in their either P&T document or in their letter, offer letters, right? So for some people, um, in some disciplines, $50,000 is a lot of funding, like for example, over an extension. 
but in some parts of engineering, you had to get two NSF grants in order to be promoted and tenured, right? So on average, 380 for $15,000 investment. We had um, a woman uh, over in education received the first NSF career award in the history of that college for $15,000 support from us. They told us that it helped them build their national and international reputation, which is incredibly important, not just for us, but for the, our institution. And at the time that we asked them, 79% uh, had been promoted and or tenured. Some of them were at the rank of associate professor, they moved on to professor. Some of them were assistant professors. Some of them um, told us essentially that not yet, which means in the next year or two, based on the timing of it, they expect to be promoted or tenured. Um, so we saw this as a really effective uh, program, and that's how we were able to convince the institution to institutionalize it. We still would like them to model it closer to the way we did it. Um, there's a reason why we designed it the way we did it. We actually think it's a better way of doing it. Um, it's it's more money. It also requires more oversight. I think that's part of the issue right now is trying to figure out how can we do that for this whole campus, given the number of faculty that would want it and take advantage of it. Uh, it always gets back to human power. So, you know, leadership development uh, was one of the um, uh, the things that uh, that came up uh, when we looked at the data in 2009. We just we didn't have very many women in, in leadership. Part of that problem is was was attributed to the fact that they were at the rank of assistant professor. So we needed to get them to associate and to the rank of professor, right? Uh, but we also needed to provide systematic training for them. But the women aren't the only one who needed the support. The current leaders needed to understand that it was their responsibility to change the culture in the unit so that every faculty member felt included, integrated in, and felt supported. And so we worked on Two things, a, a women's leadership initiative that was specifically for faculty and staff. So you'll notice sometimes we do things just for faculty, and sometimes we do things for faculty, staff, and uh, together, and sometimes we do them for faculty, postdoc, and graduate students. It has to do with where the funding comes from. If the funding came from the university, we always went further than what NSF allowed us to do, right? So we always expanded it. And so the women's leadership initiative that's been in place uh, for many years, for at least, I don't know, since 2012, I believe, um, has provided uh, training, development opportunities, professional networks for approximately 160 faculty and staff members on our campus. We can only handle about 20 to 30 each year. The Women's Leadership Initiative is under the Advanced Center um, because we try to give in individual professional development over the course of the year. Uh, we could be doing this for forever. There's just so many. Um, once you start looking at uh, staff positions and faculty positions, there are a number of people all over this campus who are looking for this opportunity. Um, so we have the Women's Leadership Initiative. And then for the other faculty who are in the ranks of uh, lead, who are leaders, we created a chairs protocol document. I don't know if you knew this, but up until two years ago, there was no standardized document outlining what it meant to be a chair or a unit leader and what that assignment, what you know, what are your responsibilities, how do you get evaluated, what are your, essentially your rights and responsibilities, how you get evaluated, and then how do we uh, build um, a series of uh, workshops and trainings to ensure that your development. Uh, and what we've been doing was essentially um, asking these leaders if we ask them anything at all, to reflect on their successes, but we weren't conducting any formalized reviews until like the end of their fifth year, and we did it only at like reappointment. And so we started a 360 review process, and what we'd like to do is do it on an annual basis. So that's just part of the evaluation process for leaders. And what, what that means then is that you normalize it, you don't just do it when people get into trouble or when they're being reappointed, and you give them faster feedback from anyone that reports to them, right? And so, uh, or, or that works with them, that includes people that, people that report to them at their level and people higher than that. So they're getting feedback from all around and they can figure out where, uh, from the 360 review, where, they, where their, the green areas are, where they're doing really well, and where there's some like red areas that need some help. And then you can talk about like, what are you gonna do over the next year? What types of training might help you 
uh, get past some of these problem areas and work through them. We want to support and develop our leaders. Uh, most of us, I think the, if you look at the data, uh, I think 5 to 10 percent of us actually received some type of training before we moved into some type of leadership position. Of all the people who are running institutions who are chairs, like 5 to 10 percent, and most of them uh, were already like in business and got it as part of their, um, their standard training uh, in their field, um, if that makes sense. So uh, we're really proud of that as well. And we continue to work with uh, um, talent and culture so that we have parallel systems for staff as we do for um, faculty training. Can I just get a squatter here and check and see if anybody has any questions before I move on? I can't hear you. Be sure to unmute if you do, like me. <laughs> I, I have a uh, comment, so I can I can wait on that until later, though. Go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I think for for those that just to kind of a connective comment, um, I think a lot of the things that you've been looking at, that the center has been looking at for faculty and then also staff, are things that we've tried to do at the center or are starting to do. Yes. Um, I did have a, a question about. Um, you know, for us, we look at obviously individuals with disabilities, and so one of the biggest factors that we know, or facts that we know, is that we are a state that has the highest, uh, one of the highest disabilities, yes, in the nation, the, the yes. highest unemployment rate. So, do you all focus, or do you think that the center would focus, again, for faculty, staff, whatever level for the university, on those individuals with one or more types of disabilities who are you know, who could easily fill those those spots? Or do you already look at things like that, like our hiring practices, you know, some of the same outcomes? Okay, so so let me let me answer it from an advanced an NSF advanced perspective first. Okay. So when it when it first started and uh, was launched in two thousand one, it was focusing on female faculty, right? As if all female faculty are exactly the same. Right? You know, so uh, ignore things like uh, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, econ socioeconomic status in terms of whether or not we were first generation faculty, right, or first generation college goers, and then how does that affect our experience as faculty members, you know, having imposter syndrome or that kind of stuff, right? And so now when you look at, um, um, and, then, and then when we started to focus on race and ethnicity, we tended to focus on African Americans. Right, and we tend to ignore tribal colleges and institutions and Latinos serving, uh, serving institutions. And so Advance has expanded beyond female to include all those categories, including sexual orientation and including uh, women with disabilities. So you could have uh, an institution that applied for an IT grant that its primary focus was on uh, recruiting more people with disabilities in, into faculty roles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so for us, it's about diversifying faculty. And so that includes faculty with disabilities, right? So, so we don't hire people, but we oversee hires, or I'm sorry, we don't oversee hires. We oversee or we work with search committees to get them to think about things that they are doing that uh, in their assessment, well, how do you advertise? Where do you advertise? What's the messaging in the ad? How do you signal to people that you want all people to know about this position and to apply for it, not just for people who look and act just like you, right? So we look at, we look at their messaging. Uh, we look at where they are sending it. And then we, we talk to them about ranking the candidates and how they might be ruling people out, uh, right? So those are the types of things that we do. So we don't, we're, we're not hiring people, but we work with departments who are hiring. And we work uh, with uh, talent and culture for the piece that they oversee with um, title, um, 
with uh, affirmative action. So, mm -hmm. for example, I'm overseeing uh, uh, searches in Statler College right now. All all the faculty searches, I'm over. I'm working with them on it. Okay, but I'm also working with their their HR representative. Um, two two of them. So we we do it as a like a three person group, uh, trying to get them to um, advertise differently, uh, to evaluate, and to find ways to include people. Use phone interviews as an opportunity to learn more about person about people before you rule them out, right? Um, you know, and I believe disability status, whether or not they're a veteran, FEMA, all of that is part of part of that data that we collect, right? Right. Through the, through the WVU hire system, and we know that on a on a weekly basis. I actually ask them to give me a report every single week on each search, and then I go back and say your your pool is not diverse enough, and you're not going to be allowed to move forward unless this pool diversifies. And here's what I think you can do to diversify it. Nice. I, I see LaShawna and Courtney on here. You know, a lot of what you're talking about overlaps with um, we have a diversity and inclusion committee, so I won't say too much. I'll let them speak about that. But the idea, you know, you mentioned the implicit bias and, yeah, and just becoming aware of those skills and things that we might not even realize we're doing. I think those are some aspects where we could reach out and learn from what you've gathered. Um, as a center. So then if, as you branch out, you know, we're constantly trying to increase our diversity and Absolutely. inclusivity of the center. Yep. So that's great. That's great. Looks like Wanda might have a question or a comment. No, I'm okay. Okay. Oh, you're okay. Should I go ahead and move on then? Yes, please. Okay. And I will talk about um, a class that we've designed for faculty and staff that deals with implicit bias. And I'm going to talk about that um, when I get closer to the end of something that we're doing right now. Um, well, well, we're doing it in the spring, and so it might, you might be interested in sending somebody from your center to it. Okay? It's free. Great. So don't you have to worry about that. Um, so uh, one of the things that we focused on was we basically said we've got to change the way people operate in their work groups, and we were particularly concerned about faculty meetings. And the reason we were concerned about faculty meetings is because we had been to so many of them, and we had watched um, a chair just report things out. Uh, we had watched uh, two or three other faculty sort of control the direction of decision making and people being silenced, because we had been silenced ourselves, right? And so we had been in what we thought were some of the worst faculty meetings we'd ever experienced, and so we had decided that we had to go at the core of that, which was how they made decisions. And so we designed something called Dialogues, which is built around essentially in, um, participatory democracy and inclusive decision making. That, that was the, the background. And what we were really interested in is shifting their group dynamic so that um, everyone came to the table, uh, were treated fairly and equally, and participated fully in the conversation. So it really wasn't a hierarchy, that it, but it was a group of a, a collective that were working together to create a vision, um, a mission, and moving forward on that. And so we, uh, it was through trial and error. Uh, we had facilitated in my department when I was chair, uh, and we knew some things that worked. And we did the same. We worked. We've worked so far with 18 departments on our campus. We worked with two departments at North Dakota State, which seems like a crazy thing, but we have a partnership with them. And my colleague uh, Jim Nolan and I go every year and work with a new department in the summer. Um, we've worked with the library system, and we have all kinds of publications and data showing that here's where the departmental dynamics were before we worked with them, and then after we worked with them um, over the course of two to three months, faculty reported significantly lower uh, levels of uh, conflict. Um, higher levels, uh, uh, lower levels of dependence, and higher levels of what we call interdependence and collective efficacy, which is believing in the ability of their group uh, to work together and relying on others to, to meet their goals. Uh, and particularly, we asked them about meeting gender equity goals, because up until that point, they felt like they couldn't meet any goals around gender equity. Um, it was beyond them in terms of um, what they're able to do. 
And so what we've done is create something that, that WVU is it's, it's trademarked and it's now like we, it's known, it's what we're known for. Uh, it's, it's cost effective. It's a facilitation process, and we are, you're able to actually take it to other places and to, um, um, uh, it can be operationalized, not just, at, it works not just at WVU, it works not just in sociology, it was very, very effective in Statler, um, it was uh, almost as equally effective in the STEM units in Eberly, uh, and what we have found is that it's uh, effective at other institutions. We have trained people at uh, North Dakota State, Montana State, Oklahoma State University, and the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. We've also done CHAIRS trainings. We've done trainings for the Women's Leadership Initiative. Um, we've done all kinds of things. And so what we've done is try to train people on our campus in this process of dialogue. We don't just facilitate for them. We try to train them so that they can facilitate when we leave. They can keep it going. Um, and we've trained people at other institutions, and we're essentially at, a, at the center of a, a pretty extensive network of institutions. This is what, it's one of the things that WVU is known for in terms of the advanced community, is, is this really intensive department level work. No other, no other institution has done what we have done. Okay, so did it, did it make a difference? Yes. So I'm looking at, I'm giving you data just from the two colleges that we were specifically focusing on, which is where the majority of STEM are uh, located, which was uh, Everly College and the Statler College. And so we know that for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, that the number of women increased from 39 to 49 uh, in the time period under the grant. That's a 48% uh, increase. Uh, women, it was a, it's a higher rate of increase than just the, the average number of people being hired. So we did uh, significant increases in the number of women. Um, the percent of women at the rank of associate professor moved from 19% to 28%. Uh, we had almost a 100% success rate in terms of promotion and tenure. Once we started watching it and they were aware that we were watching it, we had, um, uh, like I said, it's, it's a pretty high success rate for these women in STEM. Uh, we moved from having uh, 0.8, that's right, that, that number is correct, uh, women at the rank of professor in STEM to 7.69%. And for some departments, it's the first time in their history that a woman made it to the rank of professor. I am the first female in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology to make it to the rank of professor. So it wasn't just for STEM, but also for social and behavioral sciences. Okay, let me give you the data for social and behavioral sciences in general. There are a few there, questions. No, nope. that might be a little echo. Okay, um, we have fewer women in the social and behavioral sciences, but we have a large percentage of them um, of the total. If that makes sense. So we increased from 23 to 31. Uh, during the time period of the grant, and that's a 35% increase. And they moved from 45% of associate professors to crossing over finally to over half to 62%. And we, uh, we over doubled the number of uh, female professors from 21% to 47%. Um, so we know that, um, so part of this is when you put time and energy and resources and you have some an accountability, you'll start to see these shifts, right? And if you have the legitimacy of NSF and the funding from NSF, it really does help make a difference. But we had to have the president, the provost, the deans on board. And so we did a lot of work to get them on board and to, to make this happen. Now these women, because they're at the rank of associate and professor, they are positioned for professional leadership. Uh, in some colleges, you have to be at the rank of professor to be a chair or to be a dean, right? And so what we've done by moving them up is now we, we have more women than ever before, ever before who are ready for leadership in their department college or even in their discipline. Okay. So now that we're fully funded by the Office of the Provost, has anything changed? Well, yeah. I mean, we, we're... We're expanded to cover uh, 
all faculty, so not just STEM faculty, right? And so we always from the very beginning, we tried to expand the scope beyond what NSF wanted. And so we are uh, it, we're uh, a research and practice unit for faculty equity, um, and it, we're interdisciplinary. And we've stayed that way, and we will continue to stay that way. So again, the, the scope and the mission is much broader. Let me tell you some of the things. Um, uh, let me just tell you some results that show in terms of our research. Um, so one of the things, that for some reason, I didn't put this on there. We have about, um, to date, an additional $400,000 of funding, and we are in the process of working on some collaborations for some other grants uh, to see if we can get additional funding to the center. We've uh, published over 28 peer-reviewed articles and or conference proceedings. Um, peer-reviewed conference proceedings are pretty common in STEM, and so we're going to their conferences. We're not just going to our conferences. We're going to their conferences and doing uh, presentations and getting published in their proceedings. Um, we've done over 40 conference presentations. We have, uh, to date, 15 invited workshops of presentations uh, and two dissertations, which was unexpected, right? Um, in addition, we created uh, a new index of disagreement because we focus so much on group dynamics and not just, in the, we don't just focus on an individual and their, their you know, psychological um, so there's self-efficacy and there's group efficacy, right? Collective efficacy. We focus on collective efficacy. We focus on measuring the degree to which a group agrees or disagrees when you ask them a question. And what we did is create a new measure of our index of disagreement. It's called fee. Um, and uh, we're the first ones to do this. And we did it for a five-point Likert scale. And we're working on seven and nine, and it's already um, people are already following up on it. So uh, it's a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat thing. Uh, we created the first that I know of academic change agent course. Um, again, focusing on implicit bias awareness and intervention. It's a primer course for academics, members of academic communities who are really interested in engaging and transforming their institution. We offered it last fall for the first time. There are approximately 30 people for faculty and staff. We're offering it again in the spring. Uh, Leslie, if there's somebody from your unit you would like to send, uh, let me know. We're almost full. I think we've got 25 people already. Um, and it's once a month, and we have the dates for that, but I can put you in touch with the, uh, we have two people who are advanced facilitators who facilitate the class. It's a two hour uh, course once a month. You have a small amount of reading. It's designed for people who are already working 60 hours a week who can only read a three to five page thing, not a 35 page uh, uh, academic article, who can watch a five minute YouTube video on um, understanding the privileges of whiteness, um, right? Um, what does it mean to be an ally or an advocate for uh, underrepresented people? That's how the class is designed. Uh, and we, uh, it was very effective. Uh, it was so effective that we actually ran a workshop in August and invited uh, faculty from four institutions to come be trained. And they are running a class at the same time on their campus in 2019. And we have a pretty elaborate um, research project that's IRB approved for measuring the impact of the class on the class participants as well as the class facilitators across four different institutions. So we have uh, a, a pretty elaborate interinstitutional research project that we're managing right now, including getting the IRB uh, approved across four institutions. And if you think it is difficult at WVU to get IRB approval, you should try getting it at UNLV or Oklahoma State University. So I thought we were the most difficult. We are not the most difficult. Yay! I know, it's hard to believe, right? <laughs> uh, so that's one of the things that we're working on. We continue to move our research forward. When we identify something that we think would work, we try it. We try. We pilot it in a small format, and then we start expanding it. 
And then when we think we have it right, we teach other people to do it. And then we measure it and collect a lot of data and then write about it and then get it out there. So we're, that's that whole research and practice. Uh, we see fail, failure as a, as a data point. It's an opportunity to learn. And so uh, every time something goes south, we sort of hate it when it happens, but get excited about what it's going to teach us and how we might modify and adjust what it is we're doing. And so that's how we, we're, that's how we approach uh, everything within the Advanced Center. Let's try it and uh, see what people tell us and then modify, adjust, uh, and it's an iterative process over and over and over again. Um, we've engaged in helping, we've run uh, two sets of facilitations uh, over the fall semester. One started in August and just completed in December. It's the, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, we got, uh, um, our Humanity Center got an NEH grant about preparing um, humanities PhD students for alternative careers besides going, becoming a professor. And they needed help facilitating like 40 people uh, once a month over, over like uh, six months. And so we've been um, helping with that. We just completed that. We all, oh gosh, sorry. Uh, we also helped with the uh, American History Association grant uh, doing the same thing, uh, and that was a one-time thing. We are overseeing uh, Statler College faculty searches, like I, like I said, um, watching uh, the numbers, meeting with chairs, meeting with the full faculty, meeting with search committees, and explaining to them what the new rules are. and. Uh, how things are going to be different and what we expect of them, but also how we're going to support them. We are also helping the provost office with university strategic planning. We've been doing that since um, August, and you'll start to see some of the facilitation work um, uh, coming in the spring by advance. We're going to be training department chairs to run a strategic planning session in their unit. So instead of us running the facilitation, we're going to train uh, chairs and other unit leaders to run a facilitation. We're going to give them a facilitation guide, we're going to give them a training, we're going to give them worksheets, and we're going to ask them to run strategic planning exercise and to feed that information back up to the provost office. And then Advance will look at uh, those themes and feed that up to the provost. So those are just some of the things that we are working on. Um, just you know, just in terms of we will continue to uh, engage in anything that promotes a more inclusive, equitable academic community, right? That's just, uh, that's just who we are. That's what we want to do. We want to grow as many people and institutions as possible uh, who are trained in the dialogues, network, and process. And we want to integrate them into our research project and learn from them. Something that works at WVU and doesn't work at Oklahoma State, we want to understand why. And we want to figure out what that tells us, right? What are the exercises they come up with that, that work or that are more effective? Uh, our partners are very creative. They've already come up with some really interesting things um, and are using them. Uh, and so we're working on uh, a facilitation handbook. That's one of the things that we're working on. It doesn't sound very exciting, but when you're trying to learn facilitation, it, because you want your group dynamics to be different, you'll see that there really aren't very many handbooks out there that are really applied and effective, and that's one of the things that we're doing. You'll see that they're not designed by academics for academics either, and that's another thing. This comes from uh, higher education for, a, for higher, higher education, but can be expanded elsewhere. So again, we'll continue to try new things, assess them, and focus on ways of enhancing our organizational capacity. Are they asleep? Are they okay? Uh, I think they're still there. I'm going to unmute everyone. So, do you ha does anyone have any questions? I think everyone's unmuted. Isn't the rule there has to be five qu five questions before they're allowed to go? Oh, Lord. I don't know. 
Yeah, that's a rule. There's got to be five five questions. Are, they're not allowed to hang up. Five questions. We can tell. We can tell when you hang up. She can see go. it. Yep. Come on, start me off. Let's go. Hey, this is Wanda. I don't have a question. I just would like to make a statement. Sure. Um, I didn't get in on the first part because I couldn't get connected correctly. But anyway, um, just listening to the latter part of your presentation. Um, makes me much more interested in research. Research was never something that I really thought I would enjoy or would like, but um, just the second half of your presentation, like, wow, this is interesting. So, Yes, well, I, I'm not sure whose who's phone that is. It's not mine. Um, it's mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I think you. What, for us, we were, were always committed to having a research component so that it was data driven like we were going to try something we were going to test it we were going to evaluate it and we were going to have data so that when people ask us how do you know this works it's, well we were there we experienced it that's not enough we have qualitative and quantitative data right so we started it really pushed us in ways that we hadn't thought about how what are all the different ways we can measure impact a pre-test, post-test survey is a very narrow way of measuring the impact, but it's quantitative and people really respond to quantitative data. We started looking at just artifacts of facilitation. So when we worked with the group and we took photos of the work they produced, we went back and looked at some of those pr products to assess the impact, right? We did something called data uh, drops where at the end of a facilitation the, fa the facilitators would uh, wait wait until everyone left and then they would use a phone or recorder and just reflect five to ten minutes on what went well in the facilitation what worked and what didn't who was who was participating and then like something they might do differently we did these just as a way of keeping track of facilitation because we were working with so many departments we didn't want to be confused those data drops became uh, qualitative tests for us and we, we had to do a retroactive IRB to get approval to use them right so everything became um, told us something about what we were doing and so it's really broadened the way that we think about doing research we don't just do it to publish in academic journals we do it um, uh, we try to make the information accessible to people um, and now, again, expanding the research across multiple institutions, we would have never imagined that when we first started. So, one it question. Makes, it makes me happy to hear you say that, Wanda, and probably <laughs> Valerie too. I'm sure. I, I need more. I need more questions. Okay, this right. is Valerie. Hi, Hi Valerie. Okay. Um, so I have a question about has there been any indication of um, exporting this kind of strategy or the adoption of this kind of uh, process in industry or business uh, so that uh, it's the opposite. it expands? Beyond, uh. Yeah, so we, so we were trained by, uh, so we were not trained as facilitators to start with, right? We are just regular faculty members. And so we uh, had a connection um, to a woman who had done community organizing who also worked in the chemi chemistry and, and industry, right? And so she was working with STEM scientists and she was a facilitator. And so she imported what she had learned and what worked well brought it to us, we talked about it, talked it through and figured out what was more likely to work in academia and then tried some of those things and modified it. So what, how we were trained was trained by essentially facilitators from industry. But, but okay. what we found is when we had her try to facilitate, she was less effective because she didn't really understand higher education. Ah. But when we facilitated our colleagues, not our own departments, but our colleagues, and they said Senate, Senate Bill 547, we knew exactly what they were talking about. When we knew about state appropriations and the freeze on faculty hires or the fact that we hadn't had raises in five years, we knew exactly what they were talking about, right? Because we were all part of this larger collective. Thanks, that makes sense. Sure. 
I do need to cut us for sake of time, um, but I do I do intend to follow up with um, the group. I think I, we'd be interested in learning a little bit more about. Is it fee? Yes. Fi? Your assessment. Mm -hmm. I I always so I always um, it's five, but Jim five. calls. Yeah, it's five. He calls it fee though for some reason. I will probably slip and call it fee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I wasn't sure. But so so things like that, and then of course the academic change um, course. agent course sounds fascinating. So I'll get with everyone who was on here and see if there's interest in. in I know you said pretty quickly we need to get back to you, but um, there there's going to be some um, swapping of of materials. I, I imagine. After Absolutely. Today. All right. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's it's nice. We're all right here on the same campus, but we rarely get the chance to learn more about one another, and this has been great. So thank you for sharing your time with us. Absolutely. Thank you. And we'll follow up soon. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us.